Okay, we are back for a discussion of genetic assessment of the newborn. This might be one of our longest videos. It is a topic near and dear to me because that is my area of expertise. Um, you are not responsible for diagnosing genetic disorders, but a good assessment can pick up a lot of features that might be missed otherwise. So our learning outcomes for this material um, are to identify the importance of a thorough assessment of the newborn with emphasis on assessing through a genetic lens um, because we don't always detect genetic conditions prenatally. We're going to understand the concept of dysmorphism or dysmorphology and its connection to different genetic disorders. We can differentiate between minor anomalies and major anomalies. Um, and then we'll talk about the term syndrome sequences and associations. And then we'll look at the nurse's responsibility um, and need for further examination and referral for genetic disorders when we find those major and minor anomalies. So why is it important to do a thorough head to toe exam on a newborn and to get as much history as we can? Because every baby is a Jane or John Doe. They have very little information to guide us. So we need to trust our eyes and our ears. Although prenatal diagnosis is getting better, we have inherit tests to identify parental carriers of diseases. We have NIP screening to look in a non-invasive way for chromosomal anomalies. There's still a lot of major and minor things that you can miss on routine OB ultrasound. Remember that karyotype is a photograph of chromosomes. It only really gives you limited piece of the puzzle. So even if we've had amniocentesis, CVS, um, you really only catch the major, major stuff. And not everybody opts for those testing options. Some people do not. Many do not because their feeling is that they are not going to change their decision about their pregnancy on the basis of whatever is found. So we don't always get the information, um, but that information is necessary to care for that baby appropriately. Babies are preverbal. They cannot tell you that they are struggling to stay alive or that they have a hole in the back of their uh, palate. Sometimes the history might give you a clue that something might have gone awry if we knew that there was oligohydramnios, if we knew there was preeclampsia, if we knew there was a family history of sickle cell trait. Um, these might be things that give you a clue that that baby might be um, harboring some kind of anomaly, but not always. And some people come into the hospital, deliver their babies with no prenatal care, and they are the scariest ones of all because you really are dealing with a Jane or a John Doe. Um, the best way to identify a problem is to be a detective, highly methodical and slightly suspicious. There are so many things that can go wrong in embryonic and fetal development and with the formation of um, germ cells. You just never know until you look. Um, and you have to think about how a baby might hide some of those things that you, they're not immediately apparent. Um, Okay, so dysmorphology. What is the idea of dysmorphology? It's an alteration in the structure of features. So it's something that's different from the expected finding in a normal newborn. Gestalt is the term your book uses to describe the overall impression of the baby. The more experienced a nurse you are, the better you are at assessing without even knowing it. It's an overall impression. Things like tone, color, size, activity, all of those things might help form that overall impression. Then you need to use a systematic exam. And in the beginning, you're going to talk yourself through it to make sure you don't miss anything. Um, you're looking for major and minor anomalies in all systems of the body. You're looking, you're listening, um, and you're paying very careful attention. Keep in mind that if you see minor anomalies in one system, they might indicate problems with other systems. So if you're seeing little pits or tags on the ear, the ear develops at the same time as the kidneys. Um, so we would look at kidneys if we found stuff on the ear. Okay, so assessment of tone. This is part of your gestalt, um, your overall impression. Hypotonia can be associated with syndrome. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's birth hypoxia. Um, sometimes it's a metabolic thing. Um, trisomy 21, hypotonia is a key feature. Um, it makes them kind of tough feeders sometimes. Prader-Willi syndrome, the remarkable feature in the newborn period is this hypotonia. They're not usually um, really large at this point. That comes later. 
um, different inborn errors of metabolism um, as the baby gets a little older, day two, three, four of life, um, they can exhibit hypotonia because there's some metabolic error that's not processing the nutrients in that breast milk or um, formula the right way. And they're either not getting the sugar that they need or the protein that they need, or those things are building up and can't be metabolized. So look at tone. Tone is important. Then you look at facial features. Um, a lot of disabilities or disorders that are very disruptive to other systems can be seen in facial features. So I'm going to show you a few pictures. There can be genetic or non-genetic causes. So this baby has Noonan syndrome, and this is a little bit subtle, but you see how wide the forehead is, how broad the forehead is compared to the size of the chin. Um, this baby has Noonan syndrome, and it's associated with a lot of other problems in growth and development. This baby is missing the two little lines that go from the nose to the mouth. That's called the philtrum. That is absent. The length between the nose and the mouth is longer. The palpebral fissures, the opening to the eye, are smaller. The eyes themselves are closer set. Those are things associated with fetal alcohol syndrome. So if we were to see them, we would look for history in the mom if she admitted to alcohol use, um, binge drinking during pregnancy. It's not dose dependent and it doesn't show up on a drug screen. Um, so really look at that face. And if there's something that seems off about it, even if you don't know what it is, ask someone else to take a look at it. Um, and then we have this little kid here, cute as could be, has Pierre Robin syndrome. And the characteristic feature of that is called micrognathia. It's a small chin. Sometimes it's severely recessed. I think I have another picture of it somewhere that I'll show you. But if you see that, especially if it's associated with a cleft palate, Oh, make sure that you get that baby to give you a good cry and shine a light in their mouth when their mouth is wide open um, and look for any disruption in palate development. Sometimes you'll see a little slit. Sometimes the whole palate's missing. Sometimes it looks like a horseshoe, but get a good look inside that baby's mouth. This is macrosomia, microsomia. I don't have a good picture of asymmetry. Couldn't find one, but I'll discuss it. So macrosomia is these big babies. Sometimes that's associated with maternal diabetes. It's not a genetic thing, um, but we have babies that are bigger than you would expect at their gestational age, especially if you have what's called plethora, which is like these big chubby cheeks and a large abdominal circumference. Um, macrosomia can be associated with some genetic causes. Uh, beckwith wiedemann syndrome is one of them. It's a disorder on chromosome 11 associated with a lot of different things. So if you see smoke, there might be fire. Um, maybe it's just a big baby. Maybe big babies run in that family. Maybe mom had some diabetes or, you know, it wasn't detected on a screen. Um, or maybe there's something more going on. So look further. I'll kind of point out some other features of Beckwith Wiedemann. It's an interesting disorder. Okay. So here we have, there's a normal newborn right here. It's a bigger baby. Um, and we have a smaller baby, they are the same gestational age. So when that baby falls off the growth curve, um, that we call microsomia or intrauterine growth restriction can be caused by. And that is sometimes associated with genetic causes. Sometimes it's poor prenatal environment, the placenta didn't form right, or there was preeclampsia or maternal smoking or maternal nutritional deprivation. But sometimes it is associated with trisomies. Um, 16 mosaic, a lot of times has intrauterine growth retardation, the babies do catch up. Um, 13 and 18, it will be one of the features, it will not be the only feature, um, but you can see it with trisomies and other chromosomal disorders. So minor anomalies, no serious functional or cosmetic consequences. Um, found in fewer than 4% of the population. And most of your dysmorphic features are classified as minor. I'm going to show you a list in just a second. Several minor anomalies appearing together a lot of times point to um, the presence of something bigger, a syndrome or a sequence. So examples of these might be simian creases, prominent ears, low set ears, where we measure from the inner campus of the eye to the juncture of the pinna. It should be a straight line. If the ears are lower set, that is characteristic of many syndromes, um, many different ones. 
Um, Preauricular tags, that those little tags in front of the ears, I have some good pictures of those. Um, clindactyly or syndactyly, um, crooked pinky, webbed fingers, um, fingers that overlap each other, birthmarks. And I'll show you some example of those, sometimes no clinical significance, and sometimes they're associated with bigger things. Umbilical hernias are classified. Um, that, they're pretty common. Um, they're classified. So now I'm going to show you the list CDC has for congen congenital anomalies. They need to be reported on birth certificate forms as well. It's another reason to know them. So things like neural tube defects are major. And here's a list of minor ones. Problems with the fingernails or toenails. Um, extra nipples, um, earlobe creases, pits, tags, a uh, little facial asymmetry. Sometimes that goes away because it's really associated with birth trauma. Um, rocker bottom feet by themselves don't cause a problem, but they are indicative that you should look at other things because it's associated with 13 and 18 trisomies. Um, micrognathia, that small chin, Pierre Robin. Um, and sometimes we see other disorders with that natal teeth. That's kind of an interesting one. So if you're assessing a baby and they have little white bumps in their mouth, could be Epstein's pearls, which are normal, they're little cysts, or they could be like actual teeth that develop, um, in fetal life and not significant in themselves. Um, tongue tie, that's really common and it impacts breastfeeding, undescended testicles. That's, that's a pretty comprehensive list as opposed to um, some of these things that are bigger, hypospadias, which is an abnormal opening on the dorsal side of the penis. Usually that is an epigenomic thing, exposure to some endocrine disruptor like BPA plastic combined with a genetic susceptibility. You might see that. Um, clefts, cleft lip, cleft palate, all your neural tube defects, all of your congenital heart defects, uh, TEF, which is tracheoesophageal fistula, where there's an abnormal hole between the trachea and the esophagus leads to aspiration and breathing problems. Esophageal atresia, where the esophagus ends in a blind pouch. Those would be bigger things. Now <clears throat> we're going to talk about what you can see on the outside and what you might have to assess in different ways. Um, but let's go back to our slideshow. Those are minor anomalies and you know, one by itself, if you have one cafe lay spot, not a big deal. If you have nine of them, you could be looking at neurofibromatosis or some other disorder. So here are some minor anomalies. Those are your preauricular tags. Sometimes you'll see a little pit or a dimple there. Sometimes you can see creases in the earlobe. That would all be, could be of no clinical significance, could be a sign of bigger things. Simeon crease. Um, we talked about this when we talked about chromosomal disorders, very common in trisomy 21, usually bilateral with that disorder. So if you see it, look for other features. Here's a cafe au lait spot, one cafe au lait spot, no big thing. Two cafe au lait spots, no big thing. If you have a lot of them, you want to assess that baby for the possibility of certain disorders like neurofibromatosis. It's an autosomal dominant disorder, tuberous sclerosis, which is a recessive disorder. Um, and then there are a few others that are associated with that cafe au lait spot. Now here, let's say you had a baby with semi increase. You have to actually open the palms and they don't like to do that. So, you know, there are techniques for that when you, if you are a mother baby nurse, you will get to know all of this stuff. So there's the semi increase. We saw that. And now here we have clindactyly, that crooked pinky finger. Hmm. And here we have the same baby has this big space called a standal gap toe between the first toe and the second toe. Where there's smoke, there's fire. You're seeing these three things together. Now maybe you want to look more carefully at the baby's tone. Um, look for a tongue thrust. Look for the um, epicanthal folds. Look for a thickened nuchal fold. Look for all of those other features that are associated with Down syndrome because that could be what you're looking at. Um, and if it was not diagnosed prenatally, and sometimes it's not, you would want to let the provider know so that they could order um a genetic test on that baby to see what was going on. And you'd want to let lactation know because those babies tend to not be great feeders. Sometimes they are and they surprise you. Here in this picture down in the middle bottom, we have a baby with a bunch of nevi. A nevis is a mole. One mole, not a problem. Noted on the assessment form when you're doing your flow sheet. 
But if you have a bunch of them, that's a call to the pediatrician because that can be associated with syndromes um, that have neurological impacts, seizures. A lot of people miss seizures in the newborn period. They think they're just the, like an exaggerated moral reflex. Um, so you have to really uh, look at your baby's activity as well. Um, but yeah, note things like that. There's an umbilical hernia. It's a minor anomaly. By itself, it usually doesn't cause a problem, can get incarcerated. But it can be a feature of Beckwith-Wiedemann along with an ear crease, um, along with... Uh, macrosomia, um, and along with a large tongue called macroglossia. It is a disorder on chromosome 11. It can be associated with cancers later in life and with uneven limb growth. Um, so if we can identify a lot of those soft markers, that can tell somebody that it's maybe a good idea to run some genetic testing to look at that baby further. So that those were your minor anomalies. Now we're going to talk about major anomalies. These are the ones you really don't have to be such a detective. They're fairly obvious. I showed you the list from the CDC. I'll link it to this um, presentation before I post it. Um, major anomalies cause serious impact on function or appearance. Heart defects fall into that category. Any heart defect, any skeletal defect, scoliosis, you put the baby prone on the little warmer and you trace the curvature of the spine. If you see an abnormal curvature, you are going to report it, document it. Um, long bones that are longer or shorter than you would expect for a newborn. Any facial cleft, that's super obvious. A cleft lip is obvious. A cleft palate, on the other hand, you have to actually look, and that means the baby has to open their mouth. You're not gonna pry it open. You're just gonna wait until they cry, and believe me, they will. And while they're crying, you say, thank you, baby. Shine a light in their mouth and look at that palate, make sure it's intact. You're also going to stick a gloved finger in there that assesses for suck reflex. And at the same time, you can palpate for any, um, abnormal opening in the soft or hard palate. Um, a genesis of major organs, not necessarily something that you're going to see on newborn assessment, um, by an RN, a pediatric provider might notice, um, things that you miss. But if we have a genesis of the kidneys, obviously the baby's not going to make urine. So as people go along and assess that baby, if they've gone 24 hours without voiding, um, you would note that, particularly if they haven't had an ultrasound. If they've had an ultrasound, generally you would have seen that beforehand. Um, then there are disorders of organs that protrude through abnormal places. So you have organs on the outside. I'm going to show you some pictures of that. So gastroschisis is a defect where the organs grow on the outside of the body. It is more common with trisomy 13 and 18. It can happen as a result of environmental exposure where the abdominal wall fails to close when it's supposed to in embryonic life. You can also see neural tube defects and they have complex etiology that's sort of a genetic susceptibility combined with folic acid um, deficiency. That's your anencephaly and your spina bifida. Um, I'll show you a picture of spina bifida occulta, which might not be detected on ultrasound. Um, these things require medical or surgical attention. They have impact on the person's function and they can be life-threatening. Cognitive impairment is considered a major anomaly, but you're not going to see it in the newborn period unless you know that there's a syndrome associated with it. So here are some major anomalies, microcephalic babies, small heads. This one's super obvious. This baby was exposed to Zika in utero, but it can be a feature that's common in trisomies 13 and 18. Here's hydrocephalus. Um, that is fluid on the brain. So obviously a larger head circumference would be something you'd want to look at. And here's some other major anomalies. You have a cleft lip bilateral. Um, I did not have a good picture of cleft palate for this presentation. This is gastroschisis. So you can see the baby's organs are protruding on the outside and the baby's being cared for appropriately. They're keeping the organs moist. Usually it's, um, you have to have some kind of occlusive barrier to the outside so that the baby is not exposed to infections and the organs don't dry out. And then there can be surgical repair. Um, this baby here has achondroplasia Achondroplasia is an autosomal dominant disorder. A lot of times it's a de novo mutation. Um, it can be familial. Um, people with achondroplasia do um, marry and have children. But here you see that large head 
and these short and long bones. So the femur, the humerus, all of these are short. Typically, it could be diagnosed in prenatal ultrasound. I have seen cases where it was missed. I really don't know how it was not subtle, I'll be honest. Um, and then you get people who come in, they have no prenatal care. Or they come from countries and they just got here two weeks ago and you have no records. So you didn't know that they were harboring achondroplasia. Um, maybe they never had an ultrasound. Um, and here in this bottom left, we have an occultus spina bifida. That a lot of times does get missed. On ultrasound, there was one week when I was a brand new labor nurse, we had two cases of it. One was one of our nurses. She had a spina bifida occulta in her first kid who is now in college. Um, she's great, but you couldn't see it because when the baby was laying in a dependent position, um, it would sort of disappear because it was under the skin. It wasn't bulging out like a more obvious spina bifida. Um, so when they assessed the baby, they found it. Um, and that happened to my delivery three days later, same exact defect. So there was probably some environmental thing going on that interfered <clears throat> with fetal development in both of those babies. Um, here's another example of spina bifida occulta. You can see the skin covers the defect, but there's this discoloration in that bulge, like big goose egg. And here you see some scar tissue over that where the skin tried to close and failed. Um, you can get myelomeningocele, where the um, spinal cord is actually exposed, you would have to do something similar to the baby um, as you did for this kid with gastroschisis to keep those, to keep that nervous tissue um, protected until you could repair it. And then congenital heart defects, you have to actually listen. This is an echo being done on the baby. It's an ultrasound that looks for blood flow. Um, but if you look in this baby's mouth, you can see that color of the tongue is like purple, like an eggplant. Um, that's a lot of times where cyanosis will start, starts around the mouth and in the mucous membranes and it moves um, centrally. But babies who decompensate during an assessment, particularly if they have poor tone and they have a murmur, um, can have a heart defect. And sometimes that's rooted in genetic syndromes like trisomy 21. Um, and sometimes it's independent of that and there's some environmental exposure or disruption in embryonic life. Anyway, we're going to move on to what's the difference between a syndrome and a sequence and what does association mean? A syndrome is a cluster of features that are all coming from one root cause. So for example, Down syndrome, many features all caused by the extra chromosome. You have the low tone, the um, tongue thrust, you have the um, epicanthal folds and the simian crease and the thickened nuchal fold and the heart defects and the sandal gap toe. Not everybody has all the features, but all of those features are associated and they are all caused by an extra chromosome. That's a syndrome. A sequence is like a chain of events that happens. Um, Potter sequence. So what happens is the key defect is that the kidneys never develop. Now that's a genetic problem. Because the kidneys don't develop, the baby does not produce urine. Urine's a major component of amniotic fluid. So now you have oligohydramnios, which is a reduced amount of fluid in the, uh, the sac, right? You have not enough amniotic fluid. Now you have amniotic, decreased amniotic fluid that can lead to growth restriction because there's cord compression um, and it can lead to hypoplastic lungs, which are very serious. So fetuses don't actually breathe air while they're fetuses. They're getting all of their oxygen and nutrients from the placenta through the umbilical cord. That's where all gas exchange happens, but they practice breathing to make sure that those lungs are pliable, that they can expand, the airways can open, and they can have gas exchange in the lungs after they're born. So they have to practice those things um, to help their lungs expand. If there's no fluid, they can't get a deep inhalation of that, and their lungs are small and rigid as a result. And that can be very serious. Um, that's a sequence. So one thing happens and then all these other things are sort of consequences of that one thing going wrong. Association. It's when we, the relationship, we know that features are related. We just don't know what's causing them. And that might be, um, in autism, we know that Larger head circumference at a certain period of development is associated with autism. Is it causing autism? Is it a, you know, related to some third cause? What's happening there? 
We don't really know when we have more information, it'll fall under a syndrome or a sequence. But in the meantime, it's just associated features. So nursing responsibilities in genetic diagnosis. You do not diagnose a genetic disorder. It is not in your scope of practice. But a lot of successful diagnoses start with an RN who saw something and it might have been something subtle. So really get your magnifying glass out and be, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes with that baby. Start with getting experienced at normal. That way when you play that duck, duck, goose game and it's duck, 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 normal, 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 normal. You see something that's not normal, even if you don't know what it is, you identify it as something that isn't expected and you start looking harder and further. And that's, you know, nothing wrong. If you see something that deviates by getting a more experienced opinion, somebody to look at it. Sometimes they shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know. So you talk to the pediatric provider and you say, this is something that I found. I thought you should know about it. It might not be anything, but as long as a baby's stable. Now you look for features that are commonly associated with things where there's smoke, sometimes there's fire. If you're looking at a baby with those skin tags on the ears, make sure they void within 24 hours. And if they don't, that's something that would need to be noted. Um, always notify the provider of your assessment findings and document carefully, but thoroughly. I'm going to give you an example. I know it makes the video longer, but I want you to hear the story so that you understand um, the need for careful communication and documentation with this stuff. So I was working one night shift and I was assessing a baby. He was a little slow to transition, a um, little floppy in the beginning, but he pinked up and he, you know, he got good tone eventually. And that happens after a lot of deliveries because birth is hard on them. It's hard on mom. It's hard on the baby. Um, so we started to come around and I'm listening over the heart, the five little spots that I listen to atrial, um, you know, the, I go through my ape to man, pulmonic, tricuspid, whatever, down to mitral. And I'm hearing a murmur. I'm hearing it over the fourth intercostal space directly under the left nipple line. And it's not the usual murmur. I would say like maybe 75% of babies I listen to right after delivery have normal murmurs. They're just benign. And it's because they're transitioning. Their ductus arteriosus is closing. Their foramen of valley has to close. And in the meantime, sometimes there's a little regurge. Um, but this murmur sounded different and I couldn't say how it was different. I just knew that it was, it was louder and harsher and weird. Um, again, you don't have to know what things mean. You just have to know that you found them. Um, so I'm listening and the dad says, that's a lot of listening. And I said, well, we listen a lot to babies. I said, I'll tell you the truth. I do hear a murmur and I don't know why I told the father. A lot of times I don't, I'll just say, oh yeah, they're little, but you know, we listen for a long time. I told him there's a murmur. I said, a lot of babies have murmurs. I'm going to let the provider know a baby looks good. Um, I'm not concerned, but I do want them. They may order an echocardiogram. Don't be nervous if they do. A lot of times we look for stuff that ends up being totally normal. So he seemed to understand that. Um, baby was not a great feeder, but again, looked stable. So pulse sox was normal, left him with the mom, gave report to the mother baby nurse. And then I talked to the provider and I said, listen, I'm hearing a murmur. I don't know what I'm hearing, but it's not normal. Um, it's over the fourth intercostal space. And then she asked me all the questions. Is the baby pink. Does he have good tone? Is he eating well? I said, well, yes to the first two, but not a good feeder. She's okay. Thanks for letting me know. Um, Dr. So-and-so will be in the morning. I'm going to make sure he's aware of it. And we had at that point, a clipboard that had a census of our babies and any questionable findings. And it went on the clipboard. Next day I wasn't there. Doctor comes in. Apparently he assessed the baby, did not feel that there was any murmur. He didn't hear one. He questioned my skills as a nurse, called me a nervous Nelly, then started to, you know, cast aspersions on all the newborn nurses and said, we're always finding things that aren't wrong. Um, baby went home two days later. I come in for another shift. Again, it's night shift. And I'm there about 630 at night for my 7 PM shift. And we're getting a call from the ER now. 
and I'm there for this. And they're like, who assessed this baby? We need the records. I'm like, oh my God, what happened? So somebody pulled the records. My boss gets on the phone. She had gone home, but now she's on the phone with me. You assess that baby, right? I said, yeah, I remember the name. And I still remember the name. It's And I don't often. And she said, they, the baby came into the ER. He's really sick. We're going to pull the records. Do you, did you document what you found? I said, I think so. Um, I think I was pretty careful with that documentation because it was weird. Well, they pulled the records and here's the record of what I found. I, where, what I heard, where I heard it and the doctor I spoke to. Then there's assessment from other mother baby nurses about the baby's poor feeding. And there's a doctor's note that no murmur was found. Turned out the baby had tetralogy of flow. Okay. So that's four major heart defects. That's why I was hearing such weird stuff. Um, there's a grinding sound with that. And that's what I was hearing. The provider did not hear what I heard and dismissed my assessment. Never did an echo on the baby. The baby went home. Now, if you remember from PEDS, <clears throat> the ductus arteriosus is a, it's a communication channel that stays open in fetal life and it has to close. If a baby has tetralogy of flow, sometimes that ductus arteriosus stays open and it overrides the aortic stenosis. It kind of shunts blood back to where the baby needs it. It's not a perfect system, um, but it will provide enough blood flow that the baby doesn't decompensate. As that ductus closes and baby transitions, and that can take days, you don't have that shunting of the blood back to where the baby needs it. And the aortic stenosis causes ischemia to the organ. So the baby hadn't voided in two whole days. Baby was not feeding and the baby was showing signs of congestive heart failure. So sometimes the nurse will catch something that the provider doesn't. And I'm disappointed that um, other colleagues of mine did not sort of follow up on that poor feeding and really go up the chain of command to get some help for that baby before he was decompensating. He could have died at home in his sleep. His mother would have never known and it would have been a huge problem, but they did pull my documentation and they saw that it was appropriate. And for my purposes, at least it, it was helpful. Um, the baby did eventually have surgical correction of the tetralogy and was fine. Um, but that's why it's really important to do that. Now, the last responsibility as a newborn nurse is to collect samples for microarray or other genetic studies. You might have to arrange echocardiograms, things like that, if that's part of your um, scope of practice. And that is the end of assessing a newborn through a genetic lens. I know it was long. I hope it was worth it. I'll see you guys in a little bit.